during the recession, even people said, hey, I want to know what you know. But honestly, I would think in the back of my mind, well, I'm broker than they are. Having collector calls coming in day in and day out. My friends stopped calling, but the collectors would. You got to give along the way. You got to become that person before the money shows up. Because the money is just a magnifier of the soul. You get triggered when there's people around you. And uh, especially when you have a bunch of kids around you, um, they can really trigger you. And realizing that that trigger isn't about them. It's not Ever. that they suck. It's because there's something in me that's got to be fixed. People tell me, oh, money's going to corrupt me or it's going to corrupt my kids. No, because if your kids get corrupted by the money, it means you already corrupted them. I love what he's really doing to be able to be the anti-financial advisor. And he's done so effectively that so many of his clients have actually had over 300 plus million in returns over the last 13 years. As a result of that, Chris, I am looking so forward to jumping in with you today, my friend. Welcome back everybody to Flipping the Lid. You know what we do here. We jump into the stories, the real stories that have shaped some of the most significant and successful people that are creating impact in this world. And today, our guest is no different. I've had the chance to interact with him a couple of times on our live shows and other ways, and he just moves through the world extremely uniquely. I love what he's really doing to be able to be the anti-financial advisor and put himself and many other people in a position where they can actually escape the rat race of financial gain, of playing the game that typically exists. And he's done so effectively that so many of his clients have actually had over 300 plus million in returns over the last 13 years. But he's also a father and somebody who's always paying attention to his own level of growth. And as a result of that, Chris, I am looking so forward to jumping in with you today, my friend. Same here, Brian. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can tell. It is. It is. I love this show. And, you know, the only thing that's consistent across almost every episode is, is the first question I ask almost everybody. And it's, who are you in your words? I would say I'm a leader and teacher, right? Uh, someone who's, who sets example of service, perseverance, and stewardship, um, all in hopes of creating a happy and fruitful life, you know? And I mean, obviously I'm a father, you know, I'm a, I'm a father of a lot of kids, eight kids, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, really uh, just a father and, and somebody who just, uh, loves being in the world to create a ripple effect in people's lives. And I kind of want to just leave the world a better place than when I came into it. What does that mean to you leaving the world a better place than when you came into it? Yeah, I, I think Steve Jobs said something similar He said before he died. He said that he wants to leave a footprint on the planet, right? I think that means it's different for everybody. But for me, it's, you know, I really want to show up in a way that serves people and, and changes and blesses lives. Because the one thing I've been blessed with is that, uh, you know, of course, being the anti-financial advisor, right? Like, I've actually been able to be blessed to be able to retire twice in my life and be financially free uh, to a point where that's where I, I put channel my, my resources, my money, my time and my energy into helping others do the same thing. And, uh, and so that's, that's some of the big thing I want to leave behind, not just to make people financially free, but really truly live abundant, you know, really abundant, prosperous lives, you know, a life where they could also turn around and bless others' lives too, because they stop worrying about the nine to five or nine to nine job. They stop worrying about having to pay the bills and survive and just eke out a living. But instead they actually have the freedom to do what they want with whom they want, whenever they want. And they get yeah. to do it in a way it's not just selfish, but they're able to turn around and and be a, a powerful, you know, blessing in the lives of others. Yeah, I love that. And I think the concept of the ripple effect is real. It's it's significant when we can elevate and empower people to be able to do some of the things that we've done historically. And I, I think that I want to be really clear when I ask this question. This is in no way to imply that that you didn't do this. Mm -hmm. But my wife and I've had this philosophy on giving until it hurts. And what we mean by that is that we have given even in the times that we don't have it abundantly to give, right? And it's about finding the time, energy, the resources and the money to be able to make those things happen. So what I'm curious about, because obviously you, the way you even positioned it is you want to be able to free people from the nine to five. So they're in a position to be able to give abundantly. Yeah. Why is it that you think that most people wait until they have financial stability to lean into the potential compound effect of what giving can actually produce for us in our lives. Oh, they don't. I mean, I, I tell our people all the time is that, you know, if you don't do it when you're broke or even and a lot of our people aren't broke either, right? They're, they're still, sometimes they even look like from the outside, they have a great life, but yeah. if they were to lose their job today, they'd be screwed. Right. Yeah. You know? And so, no, you got to give along the way. You got to become that person before the money shows up. 
because the money yeah. is just a magnifier of the soul. It only makes you more of who you already are. So if you're a selfish jerk when you don't have money, yeah. you're gonna be even a more selfish jerk when you've got more money, right? You're not gonna change into a different person just because you have money. That's why when people tell me, oh, money's gonna corrupt me or it's gonna corrupt my kids. No, because if your kids get corrupted by the money, it means you already corrupted them. So good job, mm -hmm. you know, way to be a parent. You know, so no, that's not the case. Money just makes you more of who you already are. If you're an amazing, abundant, happy person with money, you'll be more so. You know, if you're yeah. always scared and anxious, money will make you more scared and anxious. It just mm -hmm. amplifies whoever you are in that at that time. So if you want to make sure that you're blessing more lives, start blessing them. Even if it's a smaller way than what you want to do, start somewhere. I mean, even, you know, you, you brought up a good point. I don't often bring it up, but one thing I teach people financially from time to time, it's usually, you know, very rare I'll bring it up, but, you know, I always give 10% where I make, mm -hmm. even when I was flat broke and yep. I wasn't even making ends meet, I still gave 10%. And why did I do it? Because it just works. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, you know, I don't, I can't even give you all the science behind it, but I've just noticed that when you give abundantly, you gain more abundantly. Mm -hmm. The gain is yeah. always bigger than the give, right? So, um, so I gave 10%. Now I don't mean go out and give hundred percent of all your money out. Like I'm not talking about being the widow's might and just giving everything. Um, I mean, that's, there's always got to be reason behind it, right? Some people overgive and then they're broke, you know, but yeah. but you can definitely give something. And even if you can't give money, give of yourself, give time, yeah. give energy, service, because I'll tell you, that's harder to give than money. Money is actually is. easy to give away. Giving of yourself, that's an investment. Yeah. And I mean, time is the only thing we can't get, get create more of. And so when we're giving yeah. of our time in, in many ways, energetically, it's an even a more meaningful contribution that opens you with a greater ability to receive. I, I'm really happy and grateful for how you answered that question. It's it's very, very deep in alignment with the way that I view the world. And yet it's something that I didn't always know. Right. You made this profound statement and the way you said it, I'm sure has existed somewhere else, but I haven't heard it in those words. You said that money is the magnifier of the soul. Mm -hmm. Where is it in your life? Did you learn that lesson and how did you actually adopt that lesson in your life so consistently over the last period of time? Yeah, sadly, I think I learned things better when I screw up. <laughs> and maybe, I think we all do, by the way. We all do, right? Yeah. But actually, there is psychological proof that says that you learn like 80% better um, if you from a mistake, even if it's somebody else's mistake, than you do from a success, right? And because uh, it's interesting when you asked me, I said, when was the first time? And then it hit me. Uh, the first time was actually when I was going broke. Um, and I went broke specifically after I was financially free, right? So I was- Oh, you know, after the first time you retired. Okay. The first time I retired, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the first time I did it, it was 2006. Um, you know, I quit being a financial advisor because I realized it's full crap, it doesn't work. And so <laughs> I went to go do things like real estate investing instead, and that did work. And so um, so I'm in this place, and of course, I'll tell you, like leading up to that, even as, when I was a financial advisor, right? I mean, uh, the truth is like I had a bad, e like a horrible, like deflated ego, you know, like I was, I really thought less uh, less of myself and not just think of myself less. Like I really thought I was, you know, like not worth much. Mm. So you're, when your ego is in that place of that, you know, insecurity of not enough, right? When you all of a sudden you get money, that's when you start to say, hey, I'm going to show that I'm enough, you know? Mm. And, uh, and then what I did is, uh, of course, like I went and I bought the Mercedes first. And I remember I went back to that financial advisor's office and I remember I, I took one of the guys out to lunch and we literally, I took him in my car just so I could drive him across the parking lot to the place where we're having lunch. Like that's how douchey that was, right? Just how lame that was. And so I did that. And then I remember even buying the next house. Like I wanted a house that would wow people. Like they walk in like literally like, whoa, you know? So I, I bought the make, little mini mansion, you know, that I got, you know, and all that kind of stuff just to, to show off the things that I had. Well, of course, you know, 2007 hits and uh, real estate starts getting hit hard. And then 2008, next thing I know, I'm going from millionaire to upside down millionaire. Where I was over a million dollars in debt. Mm. And uh, and I started like selling off everything. I turned in my Mercedes back to the dealership. I said, you're going to repossess it anyways. Take it back. You know, and, uh, you know, eventually my house got foreclosed upon in 2009. So I lost my little big mansion. And, uh, and when everything was stripped away, I had asked like, well, who am I? Who am I yeah. really? And am I okay with that? 
And it's amazing because that's when I really realized that, you know, the ego just inflated more with more money. When all of a sudden it was taken away, I got to kind of rebuild myself, redesign the way I, I imaged myself and who I was. And I realized I was no less valuable with, with no money than I was with a bunch of money. Mm. And it, it took me to lose everything to find out I had everything in the first place, if that makes sense. It makes and complete so, sense. Yeah. So from there, I, so as I built money again and I, I built that wealth, I was able to retire for the second time at the end of 2016. You know, I realized I'm like, well, the money doesn't matter. I don't give a crap about the house or the car. I drive a Nissan now. I drive a cheaper car than I did when I was even had less wealth than I have today, right? Because I just don't care. I don't give a crap. I'm not a car guy. You know, the house, I got big enough because yeah. I got eight kids. So, you know, yeah. but I mean, you need you need some room. Yeah, you need some room for the kids' house, yeah. all them. Yeah, there's no room for Alice, you know, on the from the Brady Bunch. So we had to like let her go and just keep the kids around, you know. But and I can't I can't tell you how many times probably on a weekly basis we're like, we can't wait till these kids move out because we got six of them that are teenagers right now. It's like get them out of the house so we can start to downsize and just live a simpler life, you know. And yeah. and that's the thing, is like that the stuff doesn't mean anything. And ironically, yeah. when it doesn't mean much to me, even though I still focus on being a wise steward of the resources I have, then it, it still expands and grows. So um, I think it's I think that's a big thing is like, you know, really, you got to fix your it, it helps, of course, you know, when you learn by mistakes. Right. But it's better that if you don't have all this money flooding in, it's better to actually work on yourself now before yeah. you get the money so that when it does come in, it comes in the right way for you. Yeah. I, again, I'm, I'm really grateful for your vulnerability and the way you just leaned right into the failure and disaster of that situation. But, you know, I will, I'm also a big believer that so often when we think we're being tested, when we think we're getting rocked, when we think we're getting knocked down, right, it's also often we're being protected and promoted. You know, you're in my path. We're not much different. I mean, I, you know, bought the hundred thousand dollar Escalade because I could and I wanted to, but it wasn't for me and lost 50 grand on it in two years when I realized this was garbage, right? The mm -hmm. custom suit jackets that I needed because of the loss of my arm, I, I, what I needed and what I got, right? There's a multiple thousands of dollars of difference between the jackets, between what I needed and what I wanted. Yeah. And in this acquisition and growing period of my life, I lived in the want without gratitude for the need. And what you just talked about is this almost forced reset in your life where you, you almost have to empty out everything else before new energy can come back in. And I look at money, right? It's called currency for a reason. It's mm -hmm. a current and it flows just like any other energy. How hard was it for you recognizing that you'd established yourself to be retired once you lose everything and have to completely start over as if all that success never existed. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> Especially because, um, it wasn't just my own financial comfort, right? It also dealt with my reputation because mm -hmm. I came out of retirement in 2007 to teach people how to get out of the rat race. And then all of a sudden, like later in 2007, I start looking at my money. I'm over, you know, in the hole about 15,000 a month between my business and my personal life. So I'm spending more, you know, 15,000 more a month than what I'm making. And, uh, and I'm quickly like losing all my savings that I'm running up on my credit. And the next thing I know, I'm over a million dollars in debt and, and just feeling completely hopeless and like a total loser. Right. And, and I had to make a choice because I'll tell you, I can't teach anything that I don't do. Cause if I, mm. if I don't do it by experience, I sound like an idiot. So I'm the same I, never I totally get that. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember I had a friend, a uh, roommate at one point, you know, during my college days, he'd be like, if I started to BS something, he's like, you don't know. He's like, you don't go where you don't know. You know, it's like, stop it. That's stupid. And so I, I really have a hard time doing that. And so during that period of time, I actually switched my message because during the recession, even people said, hey, I want to know what you know. But honestly, I don't have the money because everybody was going, to, going broke at that point. And I, I was thinking in the back of my mind, I wouldn't say verbally to them because I don't want to say I'm totally flat broke. But I, I would think in the back of my mind, well, I'm broker than they are. You know, I'm over a million dollars in debt. They, even if they're at zero, that's still a million dollars better. I mean, the homeless yeah. guy is a million dollars richer than I am. Yeah. So if I bet you I could find the money. And so I tell them, if I can help you find the money, will you pay me? And they said, mm. yes. And so I start teaching them how to find and free up cash, cash that maybe they didn't even realize was there. And then as I started to do that, that started to really catch on. Yeah, it took 
good couple of years of me perfecting that process and getting the right relationships in place. But we were almost bankrupt as a company. And then lo and behold, right when we're coming out of that low, about two years later, all of a sudden, boom, it explodes, right? And we started getting like the right people have shown up, helping serve people. And it's been awesome. And so if I didn't want it to be that long, I wish it would have been like just a couple months. But I mean, that period of going through, of, of having collector calls coming in day in and day out. I mean, my friends stopped calling, but the collectors wouldn't, right? So that was happening. You know, I'm supposed to be the guy that has it figured out, but I'm broke. I've got family members saying, hey, why don't you go back to college and finish your degree? I'm like, my sociology degree is not going to solve my problems here. I can still make more money as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Getting a bat get my bachelor's won't help, you know, but they're like, no, you've got to do that. That's what you do. You go to college, get a degree, then you get a good job. I'm like, yeah, but I got friends, got MBAs, and they've been unemployed for two years. So don't give me that crap, right? So, you know, I'm battling the world, it seemed like. Like, everything is happening. And I had to really get in a place of stillness, a uh, place mm. of peace. Even when my wife at that time was like, hey, should I move out with the kids and take them away and and till you figure your stuff out? And, you know, like, all that stuff was happening, you know? And even get yeah. the house foreclosed on right before our fourth child was born. So we had to pay, like, 2000 bucks for two weeks of rent, you know, to stay there until we had a baby. Then we can move out while my ex my, now my ex-wife has postpartum and she's crying while we're going through the move and everything i mean all that happened the thing that got me through it is i knew that things have to happen for a reason right that there are no accidents in life that there's always something you can get out of it mm -hmm. and so uh that it was almost like my fumes of faith you know how like you running on empty on your gas tank you're like yep. really i shouldn't be able to drive anymore but i think the fumes of the gas are keeping me mm -hmm. rolling into that station that's where i was with my faith in myself and faith in what I was doing. And I finally got to a point of surrender where I finally just said, you know what? I don't care if this takes 20 years. I know what I'm doing is right. I'm trying to create more value than I take from the world. I'm trying to serve people, add value, solve problems. I know what I'm doing is good. If it takes 20 years, so be it. And once I kind of release that pressure of like, oh, this has got to happen in this time frame. I always like set dates, like, you know, trying to set the goals and the dates right. and it just never worked. I was like, you know what? Forget all that. I'm just going to do what I know is right and then let the consequence follow. And seriously, about a month later, that's when everything turned around. It was after I finally let go of everything. Again, that's when everything started to come back in. Yeah. Uh, not in any way surprising. Uh, I love the alignment and the resonance that, uh, that I feel with your story. You know, it's interesting because, um, I have, I only have three words tattooed on my left arm, the arm that was detached. It's trust, surrender, and breathe. And I will tell awesome. you that surrender was profound in my life for many of the same reasons that you just described. And, uh, what I learned that you just also perfectly articulated is that the timing is always perfect if we allow it, yes. right? It's when we have expectations and confines on what that looks like that we ultimately live in disappointment instead of being able to see how it can all grow. I picked up early in your conversation around this historical lack of worth and this mm. ego element that existed with you. Could you give a little bit of framing and perspective to what you learned were some of the greater contributing factors to you personally feeling like your worth and your value wasn't what the outside world already was recognizing it for? Yeah. You mean like where it started from? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think it started from a very young age. Um, I know with, uh, you know, being at you know, home, I had a very, like, strong, um, very domineering type of father, right? Um, and I was more kind of the introverted, quiet kid. And I probably became even more introverted and quiet just because of that reason, right? I kind of, of just fell back in the shadows. Now, he, he did great things to build me up. He always told me, like, hey, he's smart. Like, he even, he even told, you know, his, you know, my mom, he said, listen, He's too smart. Don't put him in preschool. Just put him right into kindergarten. Like he's too dang smart for preschool, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know? And, and so he would build that part up. Um, however, like still, I, I didn't quite feel like I was measuring up mm -hmm. and even like high school, like high school was interesting because I would get good grades. I didn't have to apply myself very, very much. Like I kind of just did what I had to do to get halfway decent grades, but I didn't have the highest GPA. I was definitely not valedictorian, although I was like a, you know, 3.6, 3.7 GPA, but it wasn't the best there. And I did sports. I did, I did tried five different sports while I was in high school. 
never really excelled where I was the best there either. So even when it came to scholarships and I was too dang white in majority, you know, being a white male, there's like, I couldn't even get the minority scholarships that, you know, they wouldn't give me anyways. Right. So, I mean, everything, like nobody cared. It's like, I was just overlooked and I felt mm. that growing up and even like trying to get jobs. I could be like, man, why is that? Why is my friend like get all these great jobs and has all these great connections? I don't have those connections, you know, and mm -hmm. especially being in a small town and, and my parents, well, my mom was, she was well connected, but then she moved away. So it's kind of like, you know, I was just felt I was alone. And, um, and like I said, like, it was really during that time, like for me, they started to build up that worth was when I was losing everything. I was really trying to find my own purpose and really what were my unique abilities and strengths, right? Because for example, even in college, you know, and now college actually had a better GPA than high school, right? I mean, I had a no problem being a student there, but what was interesting is that I was just good at like everything, you know, like yeah. I was good, but I was never great at one thing. Like I always envy the people who are just like, they're very talented. They could be a musician or an artist, you know, or maybe they're just like the math genius. And yeah, I was, I was good at math, but I hated math. Right. I liked, you know, I liked statistics when it came to like people, like, and how people behave. And that's why I went to sociology, you know? So, so for all of a sudden, like, like, well, like for a guy that's like a Renaissance man, right. He's, you know, sociology major with a triple minor in Japanese ballroom dancing and psychology. What is he going to do, you know, with his life? Right. And, and I found out that really like, really doing what I do best, like being my own, you know, being my own business owner, right? Like that's kind of what a CEO does. A CEO kind of has to know all the different departments, you know, they have to kind of speak the languages of these different places and bring it together to unify and lead mm -hmm. a team. And I never as a kid thought of myself as a leader, but I remember like even just growing up, like I remember at 15, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that book just changed my life because I, I, I realized I felt like I had a voice, even though I wasn't yeah. using it. Right? I felt like I had a greater purpose and a greater mission, but I wasn't sure what that is. But as time went on, especially as I really went through that period in like 2008, I really realized like I've got a bigger mission and a purpose in my life and a vision, you know, and, and that's, and that kind of, that kind of gave me my North star to really help me excel uh, beyond that. Yeah. I, I, I love, again, how you're answering all these questions with absolute transparency and with the lessons that are embedded in them. You know, I think what you described is not an uncommon path for so many people to, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately feel like they're being looked over in so many cases to be surrounded by people yet feel completely alone and always be looking in certain some sort of some sort of fashion to right receive love, validation and connection through performance. Right. And it's 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 I think a lot of the credo of a lot of high performers, because as a result of it, we learn how to do things, how to move through the world, how to navigate social situations. And and yet a lot of it's rooted in this place of just trying to have someone see us and understand us. And yeah. many times our inability to have the world see us and understand us is a direct correlation to us not seeing and understanding ourselves. And so, so how you tied all of that together is just beautiful because ultimately it's lack of direction, lack of clarity on who we are, lack of clarity on who we want to do this with for and who we want to impact that ultimately leads to us feeling stagnation, lack of growth, lack of clarity, feeling overlooked. And mm -hmm. I love how you articulate all that. I, I want to jump right in because you did reference it as well, right? You've got like this Renaissance man, you talked about your three minors, but you also were what, 20 years or no, for a little while, you were one of the nation's top amateur ballroom dancers. So it was <laughs> a, a minor at school that turned into becoming one of the top amateur dancers. Talk yeah. a little bit about what got you involved as a ballroom dancer and what do you feel about the structure of that style of dance that you were able to learn from and apply to other parts of your life? Yeah. What got me into ballroom dancing? Girls. Playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's great true. answer. <laughs> I mean, well, like I came, like I said, I came from a small town. Like they, I mean, they, they actually filmed twilight near my town. Like that's, it's that mm. kind of small town, with like a few thousand people just outside of Portland, Oregon and stuff. And well, I remember uh, like, again, as a kid, I was totally reserved and quiet. Well, when I went to college, I, they told me last minute, they said, hey, you actually don't need that math class because you took two semesters of calculus in high school. So mm. you've got, you know, you've got, you know, we're going to take that off your schedule. Well, I need one credit to be full time. So I'm looking at all these different classes and I hear this girl talk to this guy saying, hey, there's lots of girls in this class. You should do it. 
And I didn't know what class she was talking about, but I eventually kind of <laughs> creeped around to see where she was looking on the paper. Cause this is back, you know, this is before internet. This is like, yeah. you know, when, you know, you have, they post stuff on the boards, you know, like the paper is like, you know, you oh, tear yeah. off the stuff off the oh, sides, yeah. right? It was like that. And so I go look and it's like a social dancing class. So I didn't know how to dance at all. In fact, I had my ego destroyed in junior high when one of the kids told me, he's like, your dancing sucks. Get out of here. You know, and I <laughs> yep. never danced again. So I thought, well, why not? So I did, I added the class. They asked me to bring roommates because they always need more men, right? So I brought like four of my roommates along with me. And, and I was actually honestly the suckiest one there, like of all the roommates, like they all had done like some country dancing or something crazy like that. I'd done nothing. And, and I finally started to click a little bit after a few months, but I was really kind of sucky. I mean, girls would actually walk around me to go dance to the next guy. I mean, so I wasn't a great dancer, but I had enough fun that I did another semester of it. And then that second semester, I really started to apply myself a little bit more, started to like study it. And uh, I remember I actually did the New York Hustle, which is like an old disco type mm -hmm. dance, social dance. Uh, and I ended up winning fourth place in the competition. And as that started to build my confidence, then I started to pick it up faster and faster as my confidence build, right? Um, eventually got on a dance team, uh, took a break for a little bit and then came back and did it again. Started getting like professional help and things like of that nature and then moved to Utah where the two, the world championship ballroom dance teams are. Went to one of those schools and uh, and got on the world championship team and, uh, and even danced, uh, you know, in the competitions and things like that. I always say amateur because I never went pro, although I did take some money under the table and people do lessons, but I would never officially come out as pro. But I, I did do that for a little while in the early 2000s and loved it. And I think the thing that really helped me develop that was because two reasons. Like one, I like to master things. I like to repeat it over and over again. I just I'm very persistent. Right. But two, I also like teaching. And one of my little secrets was that I was able to like when there would be other people in the dance class or whatever it be, I would try to teach them as well. And sometimes mm. I even teach the girls. I would teach the girls part as well as the guys part. I would learn both. And as I started to learn it, of course, the teacher becomes the best student. Right. Mm. And so where there was a lot of like really good dancers that had been dancing since they're like three, four years old, I was competing at their level within really three to four years because I was just so willing to teach and and repeat and just keep doing things and finding i'm really good at finding patterns too and shortcuts and so yeah. you know i kind of like i'm kind of a scientist that way so doing that kind of stuff really got me to progress very quickly in that realm even though naturally as a dan dancer i'm not talented it was really about those other skills that helped me in the place of ballroom dancing and that's proven to be true in business where i've done the same thing as well in mm -hmm. business it's proven to be true now. I'm more of a marathon runner, so I do that more than dancing nowadays. Um, it's just like I'm very I like to be formulaic. I like to know like what's really works and what doesn't, and yep. and and then I'm willing to share that information to learn it and instill it in me as well. The power and gift of being able to recognize patterns is truly a game changer. I think whether it it doesn't really even matter because if you have the ability to see patterns, you can apply that to every single thing in life. Mm -hmm. I also like the specific focus on, on you enjoy teaching. Now on your intake form, you did write down something that was pretty clear. And so I wanna just ask the question in an open-ended manner, mm -hmm. what was it that caused you to learn to teach things? And utilize that as a skill that clearly benefited you in ballroom dancing and everything as a result of it. Yeah. The first time I really started to try to teach things was I think junior high, um, mainly cause I was getting sick and tired of the jocks, you know, trying to uh, copy my papers, you know? So I would, uh, I would actually purposely try to teach at a very simple level. Right. So I would try to dumb it down big time so that even like the most ADHD kid that's there, to try to do it because I was just sick and tired of them copying my work. It's like, do your own dang work. You know, like I got mine, I did my work, you do yours, right? So I try to teach it to them so they would do it rather than just copying my homework. And uh, and and they kind of just started from there. Like, and and again, I, I love to teach, I love to share, and I love to help. Um, yeah. Actually, even earlier, I remember I was nine years old. You remember the Oregon Trail game that you might have played? Oh, yeah, dude. Well? I, I loved that. Yeah. Well, well, try being from Oregon. Of course, you're going to do Oregon Trail, you know? <laughs> well, in fourth grade, my teacher decided to do like an actual live version of it. Um, and I mean live, I didn't mean like we're actually on the Oregon Trail huffing right. and puffing away. Um, but she had like this big thing up on the board with the full map, right? Of like the different trails and stuff. And there's even like different points I could detour off. 
And it just happened to be at that time that my mom, who owned an art studio, had some students that were former Cherokees. And they're like, oh, yeah, my, our ancestors lived on that trail. And so they would tell me, they say, hey, when it forks here, take this one. Even though it's longer way around and it, you have to, it takes more time to do that, it's better than going straight because that's where a lot of times uh, set, you know, pioneers got killed. So I would do that. And the funny thing is in the game, people are like, well, we're going to take the shortcut, of course. And then they end up getting stopped or killed or whatever along the way. Broken or wagon wheel, wheel, out of food. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. So like, I found myself kind of being like a guide for these kids. And they're like, are you sure? I'm like, positive. Like, that's what they said. Like, you just take their advice and, and let's use it. And we end up winning the game. And that was like such a proud moment for me that even though I didn't get the, the F, you know, like the, the credit per se, because it was our whole, you know, our right. whole team in that class still like to contribute, to be able to give something and be able to help guide them along and get them that result. I think that really inspired me to say, I really like doing that. I like to be able to help guide and give people some, some, some real direction, you know, in a sense, I don't yeah. have to do it for them, but if I can actually give them something that'll get them a leg up in life, that's uh, that's worth it. Well, and I love that a forced necessity to not want to be cheated off of is what led to this kind of passion to also help others, right? It's mm -hmm. additionally more work for you to elevate and empower them in that scenario versus just benefit off of your work. And clearly teaching requires your ability to learn. But what's beautiful about teaching is it's a different level of mastery. Because to be able to teach, you have to understand at a completely different level. But again, you have to understand the foundations of learning in the first place to be able to simplify and teach effectively. Now, mm -hmm. I have learned that my kids have become some of my greatest teachers. And I only have two. You have eight. So what would you say is probably the greatest thing that your kids have taught you? Oh, boy. Uh, I would say the greatest thing is probably humility because <laughs> mm. let's be honest as parents we don't know what the heck we're doing right like we we think we know what we're going to do as parents before we have kids and then when we get kids we realize just how bad we are and like anything like any situation where there's a challenge it's like those weaknesses right those mm -hmm. those uh those i don't know if i call it imperfections it may not be the right word but just like those flaws that you have in you, they just kind of bubble up to the surface, right? The things that trigger you, for example, emotionally, mm -hmm. will bubble up to the surface when you start having relationships involved. Like when you live by yourself, you don't get triggered by people, right? Mm -hmm. You get triggered when there's people around you. And uh, especially when you have a bunch of kids around you, um, they can really trigger you, right? So, you know, and realizing that that trigger isn't about them. It's not ever they suck, you know, <laughs> they're not like they're bad kids. It's because there's something in me that's gotta be mm -hmm. fixed, right? And I'll tell you, like, if anything, that's that's a great leadership thing to learn as well, because if you're trying to lead other people like, you know, how many times have you ever watched shows like The Prophet, you know, with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mark, uh, Marcus uh, Lamonis, right? Mm -hmm. You watch like The Prophet, how many times that they, they'll say they'll try to accuse and blame their team like, oh, my team, they're the ones that do it. My employees, like I've fired so many people as them. And then Marcus has to say, no, it's you. It's you as a leader at the top. You're the one that needs to change, not them. In fact, you fired good people. You need these people actually back. And uh, and that's what I've learned, too, as a team, is that when I start to realize that it's not about me, and uh, if anything, it's more my issues that come up, and it's not about them. It's about how do I work on me more? I've noticed that even my team elevates with me, too. And uh, yeah. it's the same with kids. Like, if you yeah. work on yourself as a parent, the best way to help your kids is become a better version of you mm -hmm. and uh, treat your spouse better and do everything you can that way because... They're going to see that whether you can teach it verbally or not, they're still going to see that example and they're going to, they're going to, that's what they're going to learn life. from. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely true. Uh, again, not surprising based on every other answer you've given, but that was just absolutely beautiful. It's almost an exact reflection of the way that I feel and what I was able to learn through all of my experiences so far as being a father, you know, mm -hmm. eight children is more than most people have, but you have six that are currently teenagers and the teenage <laughs> years in and of themselves are challenging. What does your household look like today? And how do you uh, maintain and find those moments of quiet time that are so important for you in stillness? Well, I'll tell you the silver lining in divorce, although I don't recommend it even for my worst enemy, silver lining is at least they're not with me 24 seven. You know, yeah, for those right. that have their kids 24 seven, even if it's like six or seven kids versus eight, uh, I think that's harder, you know, honestly, but uh, I get a break at least every other weekend. But, um, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, right now, I mean, we've got at least five still at home, you know, that are still there. And, 
And uh, it's it's it can be a little chaotic, especially when they all want to have a voice. They all want to be heard I'm trying to do that. And I'm not a very good person. Like when there's distractions around me, like it's hard for me to focus because I can't tune out very yeah. easily. All the, the background noise, you know, and things like that. Like I need to be more one on one. So one thing that helps is, is try to have that one on one time with each kid. You know, even mm -hmm. if it's like at bedtime, like with, every, you know, like when I you know put my kids to bed, like we'll pray together, you know, and then after that, like. I'll even go with the younger ones. We'll even do like another prayer for just them doing their own individual prayer. I'll let the older ones do their own, but just kind of spend that time with them. You know, their bedtime, if it's just a few minutes to connect and talk with them and kind of see what's on their mind. And I definitely could do a better job of getting more one-on-one -on -one time. I used to do when it was only four yeah, or five, I used to do like a, a late night, as we call it, where I would keep the kids awake. Just when we send everybody else to bed, maybe keep one kid up for another, you know, 15, 30 minutes awesome. after they all went to bed for one night a week. So like Monday through Friday, we'd pick a night and then we would have, you know, that late night. And I'll tell you, like, that was some of the most special, precious times with, with my own kids, especially where they loved it. Like they could not wait for their late night and they knew what they wanted to do for their late yeah. night with daddy, you know? So, you know, those kind of things, like that kind of investment, I, and I haven't done that, like I said, like I ran out of days of the week, but <laughs> You know, have to have date nights still too, but uh, but that's a big thing. Like that's that's just having at least that one on one time, even if it's just while you're driving the car or whatever it might be. You know, finding those moments. Yeah, you referenced Malcolm X, and reading that book was what allowed you to recognize that you not only have a voice, but that it can be used and spoken. You reference all of your kids wanting to have a voice in the house at the same time, right? And obviously, that's within a safe and protected environment. That book was the turning point for you, but how have you used that lesson to facilitate and foster your children knowing their voices and being able to use them effectively in the world? Yeah, it's tough because, uh, I mean, especially with divorce, like you get two different cultures all of a sudden, like it really separates mm -hmm. out um, where before when you're married, like it's sometimes you can kind of make your own culture, blend it together. And so now it's become more apparent the differences between uh, mindsets and things like that. And so the best, the best thing is just try to encourage it. Like, I, I love that my oldest daughter, you know, will actually talk to us and we'll hear things sometimes years <laughs> before, yeah. you know, my other, my ex-wife. And it doesn't mean like I'm the better parent necessarily, but, but she, I, I, I like the fact that she trusts us enough that she wants, she's willing to be open with us, you know? Mm. And, and I think that's, that's, what's important is that, you know, allowing them to feel like you're not going to judge them necessarily. Like, you know, especially with whatever challenges they're dealing with or, identity crises, you know, which definitely is more of a challenge today than ever, you know, those kind of things. Like it's really, it's really good to be able to get your kids to feel like they can trust you and be able to share with you versus hold back or even lie about their life. You know, like yeah. obviously if they're lying to you, it's because they don't feel safe and you got to yeah. ask yourself, well, what can I do to create a more safe environment that's, you know, not, where they don't feel like they're going to be judged or reprimanded or something like that, but you can still love them regardless of whatever that comes out of their mouth. Yeah. I absolutely couldn't agree with you more on that. They have to have that sense of safety. And I would say that the primary focus on that is emotional safety to know yeah. that they're going to be okay and held regardless of what happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And so even your clarity there is, is just absolutely beautiful. What is your biggest problem in life or business today? The biggest problem in life is probably what I just, I just realized maybe an hour ago <laughs> before okay. this interview, um, I was sitting in, sitting in an event and this guy was, you know, I'm at a mastermind group right now or community right now. And it's a bunch of real estate investors in the room. And this guy gets up talking about businesses and he's saying, you know, we're like, where you should be able to walk away from your business and turn off your phone for an entire week. And, uh, my, uh, CMO, she looked at me and she's like, you going to do that, Chris? And I was like, Oh, no way. Like that would be the most unrelaxing vacation ever. And, and even though I've built up a lot of systems, I got great team members in place it's, it's so hard to let go of something that just a few years ago, I was like literally the only person in my business. Mm -hmm. Like I was managing everything. I even let go of my VA, you know, my virtual assistant. And, and so I really realized that duplicating my efforts and, and training people up. Um, in fact, uh, that's, I, I think I have more faith in doing that now than, than ever, but it's still, it's a process. I got to trust, you know, I got to let go, right. Surrender in a sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, not, not, naively, but, but at a point say, do we have everything in place where Chris could still step away and things could keep running? And so I'm now firing myself from different seats in my own business. You know, I'm trying to let that go and let go of that control so that other people can step in and do it instead. 
And so it's, it's fun, but it, man, it's, uh, it's, it's more challenging than, than it is like the dream you want it, but to actually do it is another thing. Yeah. Well, I, I also want to call attention to just a small nuance and all of our audience will understand this when, when they hear it. But even in the language of what this other person said, they said, you should be able to walk away from your business for a week, right? Yeah. Should in and of itself is a shame-based word. It's implying right. that whoever you are, whatever you're doing, it's not good enough. Right. And so mm -hmm. the question then becomes, does, is that a desire that you even have to walk away from your business for a week? Right. Without mm -hmm. having to look at it, think about it, because it's also something that I can see feeds you, feeds your soul, feeds your purpose and your mission in lots of ways. And so it, it's, it's interesting because I recognize how often we allow these outside lenses to tell us who we should be, what we should yeah. want, how we should run and operate our lives. And so I guess that would be the better question is yeah. if, your biggest problem is about trying to continually pay attention to where you can fire yourself and create systems, mm -hmm. right? It seems like that is not necessarily problem, but opportunity. And Absolutely. so the question then becomes, right? What is it that you desire most? Do you desire to be able to have a business that can completely run itself autonomously without your involvement? Right. Do you desire yeah. to have some level of influence to continue to innovate and bring it down the path? And so that's what I would be curious about for you is yeah. if you remove this kind of shame statement telling you where you should be or how you should operate, knowing that you have your own voice and knowing the clarity that you have on you, what is it that you most desire for this part in phase in your business? Well, yeah, like I, I announced to my team that in the next few years, I actually want to be able to, to walk the uh, the Camino de Santiago there in mm. Spain through Portugal, which, you know, it, depending on how many miles you walk, it easily be like a month, month and a half to walk yeah. the whole 500 mile plus trip, you know, from like South France all the way down to Portugal, the coast of Portugal there. Uh, so that's going to be kind of like my dream there and, and be able to have like sporadic minimal management. And uh, I'll tell you like that. Uh, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's good because it gets my mind to expand, to figure out, well, how would I make that happen? Like what right. would have to be in place for that to be possible, you know, and what can I create there? And so, uh, and I'll say in that guy's defense, like he may or may not have used the word should, I might've been my interpretation. Either, either way. And so I, I'm happy that you're defending him. I just was calling attention to even that word and the placement of it, regardless of the, the intent of the source. Right. Well, it's, it's not even so important about what he heard or about what he said was what I heard. Right. Bingo. Because right Bingo. that's the big thing it's like what did i hear because because it's like oh i don't really have a business until i can walk away that's right. what it should be you know right. so easily i could have subconsciously added that word in you know just for that reason but but uh but no like that's that's something that i've i've told my team said okay we got to make sure this happens but i've realized more and more it's not the as much the systems and everything else right because i i want the company to go beyond me like you were saying like i want that to create that ripple effect even when yep. i'm not around you know, that's the ripple effect I want to continue for generations as well. And so for that to happen, I've got to be able to pull myself out of the equation to where this mission, and I'm starting to see it. Like I just had my team retreat with all of our team. I flew out all my team with their families and everything. We flew out to Florida here and, uh, and had our annual, you know, team planning meeting and got to get to know the families because obviously they got to get rewarded just as, mm -hmm. you know, just for allowing their family members to be, you know, sacrifice some of their time to work with us, you know? Um, so just to be able to do that was so awesome. And, uh, yeah. and I'm starting to realize that ripple effect is starting to take a life of its own. That it's not just on me, that now that culture of giving, you know, we have four values of, you know, really like giving, like really that service minded, service mindedness, if you call it that integrity, humble confidence, right? Like, you know, you're awesome, but you're not going to beat your chest about it, you know, as well as just, uh, you know, always striving for improvement, you know, those kind of things. Like now I'm starting to see that they are embodying that, which I value so much. Now they, they value it too, or they've already valued it from before they met us. And now they're part of that team and we're walking together on this path. And it's exciting. It's really fun. Yeah. It sounds like it's really exciting. And I, I, you know, clearly you get it. You prioritize people over profits. You recognize the importance and dynamic of what really our world has put us all in a position to do, which is that there isn't work-life balance, there's integration. And you recognize the mm -hmm. impact as well as the hopes, dreams, and desires for families to experience the wins, have that outlet. Uh, you know, that foundation to really focus on the people around you, I agree, 
far outweighs any system that you will create because any system, whether it's technology or people, is going to be dependent on the technology or the people performing. And so that still always is the priority. You know, you, you've talked a lot about this concept of surrender, right? It's come up a couple of times and, and truly surrendering also is being willing to release old beliefs, Mm -hmm. old self image, old cellular reactions and memory. What, what was it that got you to finally wake up and listen to lean fully into this concept of surrender and continue down this path of releasing the old image of you? You know, a great question. Um, I think it's just something that keeps appearing as a pattern throughout my life. Um, what, when you just asked that, I just had a memory pop in from first grade. Because, mm. you know, naturally, that's when a lot of those things show up, right? Yeah. I remember uh, if you looked at my report cards, kindergarten, teacher raised about me how smart I am and how, you know, just a great help. Second grade, you know, I learned what the word conscientious meant because I didn't know what it was. But I looked it up in the dictionary after she put it in there because I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. And she said, he's amazing. But if you look at my first grade report card, Chris is a problem child. <laughs> mm. You know, Chris doesn't listen. Chris doesn't pay attention or follow instructions correctly. Like all that kind of stuff showed up. And, uh, and I remember like that year was so hard. Every single day I was getting reprimanded about something. Like I was always quote unquote getting in trouble again, mm. smart kid, but for whatever reason, like I just couldn't get it together. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I realized looking back, it probably was more her than me, but, uh, <laughs> probably, <laughs> but for whatever it was, it was cool. But it still left an impression, right? It sure did. Yeah. And I remember towards the end of the year, uh, it was, it, I had a bad day, especially where she had to put my name with two check marks behind my name. And that's for a guy that wants to be a good kid. You know, that's, you might as well just said, I'm going to hell, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so I went home crying that day and I remember turning on He-Man, you know, cause you know, I like to watch my you know, afternoon cartoons. So He-Man came on. And I remember visually, like I, I remember seeing like the TV screen. You remember like the old TVs that you turn off and it goes down to a little point, a little mm -hmm. pinpo pinpoint. Yeah. yeah. I remember the ones that had the knobs and the turn on buttons and the turning uh -huh. and all of them did that. <laughs> they all did. Yeah. That. They all mm -hmm. you know, did that. And they all like shrunk to eventually yep. a little pinpoint and then boop, mm -hmm. it's gone. Right. Well, that's what I started picturing. I started like watching the cartoon, but I started watching my, my field of vision start to squeeze in and it's like mm. just getting smaller, smaller. And it, instead of it was just he man, I was watching, I was watching like, all of those memories of that first grade and getting in trouble and I would try to put it out and then I'd try to pop back again and I try to squeeze it in and it'd pop back and then finally just squeeze it to the pinpoint and then pff, gone. Well, the next day I go to school and at the end of the day, also my teacher says, Christopher, because that's what they called me back then. Like, Christopher, you didn't get in trouble today. And I was like, what? Oh yeah, I didn't. Like I hadn't even thought about it. I was going to even get in trouble. And I I'd lost that I like expectation of that identity at that point. Yeah. And, I think throughout my life, when I've done something similar to that, almost like my own self hypnosis, although I can't do all of those things because sometimes you just need outside help to get. Of course, to remove, totally agree. Move those deep things. You just, it, yeah, you can't self medicate. That's why I've not. Them. That's why I've not had a single period of time in the last twelve years that I haven't had at least one coach. Because exactly. look, we all have our own blind spots. That's right. Yeah, and there's some things that are so deeply rooted that mm -hmm. you can't just pull off the, the top of the weed and yep. watch it grow right back again. You got to get right down that root. You got to get all the way to the source. Yep. That's if you don't right. get the, if always. you don't get that root out, it's never going to fix it. You got it. So, so I mean, so that that was one thing I could work on. But I've realized, like through time, like almost everything that's that creates unhappiness in my life is usually comes back to something like that right? Like something where I'm triggered or I create an identity that maybe isn't serving me anymore. You got to create that new identity. And heck, I'm even like going from like over, you know, pretty badly overweight to also becoming a marathon runner. Right. right. And, and actually call myself, like you asked me who I was. I think I, I can't remember if I said it or not, because I probably got sidetracked on eight kids. I was like, dude, I got a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I even like my identity, I put myself as an athlete. And mm -hmm. I remember my wife even one point said like, you got to stop identifying as that because, you know, when you get hurt, then you start to feel depressed. I'm like, no, I'm still an athlete. Like, that's yeah. what I am. You know, like now I'm in the top you know percentage of marathon runners out there. So, no, I am an athlete. And that and just to say that that identification and, and going with that is is amazing. Like it's especially it's, given the contrast of you recognizing that you weren't really ever good at sports growing up. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and just, so okay. it was never a part of your identity. But to become an athlete, it's something that 
you carry great pride in because right. of your ability to move your body, right? And and do exactly. things at a level that maybe you couldn't have or wouldn't have in a prior period of your life. So that's that's a beautiful thing, right? And oh, by the way, all of these things that you're talking about are the ripple effects of life, mm -hmm. right? They sure this are. is truly what it all is. There's a reverb, there's an impact, there's a ripple to every single choice, every single action, every single breath we take, right? That's why there's concepts called the butterfly effect. That's why it's mm -hmm. right, the, what, what this looks like. So you focus so much on the ripple effect to the point that your podcast is even called Money Ripples Podcast. And yeah. a lot of what you're teaching people is how to utilize the ripple effect of life to allow their money to work on their behalf so they can create the freedom that they want. And so right. how are you specifically engaging with individuals today? And what are the core concepts that you're teaching to enable people to lean into the ripple effect that's available to all of us? Yeah, one thing we teach is that, you know, really cash flow creates freedom, right? Um, and what I mean by that is when you have a lot more money coming in than what's going out, you've got freedom. That that difference in between people in business call that profit. You need personal profit too, don't you? Yeah. Like you really do. And so we look for ways to get rid of money leaks, but we also look for ways to do what my shirt says, which says I love passive, passive income, income, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is true. Like getting that passive income coming in where your money now works harder for you. So you have to work so hard for it, right? Mm. Because everybody's telling you, put your money away, lock it away in prison for the next 30, 40 years. And hopefully, if you're lucky and the market smiles and you just right, you might have some freedom when you're in your 60s or 70s. But that's just not true. Because like my, my dad's story where he worked so hard, he was a penny-pinching saver. He was like Dave Ramsey's older brother that Dave Ramsey said, I want to be like him when I grow up. Right? He was doing all those things. And then when I sat down with him as a financial advisor, he said, I'm 61 years old. Can I retire yet? I said, Dad, despite, despite being debt-free and having this money you've stuffed in your 401k, you better hope you die in five years if you try to retire today because yeah. you'll run out of money, right? Yeah. And that's what got me off that path, realizing I'm just a salesman in a suit, like this stuff doesn't work. Mm. And so that's what the real focus is, is, how do we get you to create that life now? Because you have no guarantee of tomorrow, you definitely have no guarantee of 30 or 40 plus years from now. And especially if it doesn't work, why keep doing it? What if we can get you your life back? What if we can shave off years or decades to where like the next seven to 10 years, you could actually be at the point where you're work optional. You work because you want to, not because you have to. That's a place of power. And that's when you stop focusing on being so consumed on paying your bills. Yeah. And now you start to look outside of yourself saying, whose life can I bless? That's the real purpose of what the Money Ripples podcast address. I love it. I love it. So I'm curious, the format of the Money Ripples podcast, do you have guests on? Is it self-led teaching? Like, give us a little feel, because as we know, all, all podcasts are created equal, and I love the message and the theme. Yeah, there's two podcasts a week. So the first one's usually just with me, while the second one has a guest. So we try to invite people on that, you know, sometimes there are p normal average Joes that come on that said, hey, here's what I'm doing now. A lot of times there are people that have been there, done that. It could be people that are in the alternative investment space because we tell people to go outside of Wall Street and go onto Main Street, which is like real estate investing and things like that. Um, we even bring on people that do like, you know, business coaching from time to time or whatever for those, you know, people that are oh, business owners as well. So anything that can help people become more free, that's what we try to teach to really help them break that pattern. I love that. Um, that's truly what we're always trying to do is to find some level of freedom in our lives and mm -hmm. to continue to create that. I love your focus on impact and really amplifying and elevating other people. What will the ripple effect of all of the choices and activity in your life leave in terms of your legacy? You know, I hope it would be something that actually allows uh, where people would say like, man, like Chris really gave of himself. Like Chris, you know, Chris really helped me out here. Um, and even more so, I think even better that people don't even have to name me. You know, if they just like, you know, my life is better because of what I've learned and what I've been able to apply. Because I remember when I first started learning some of this stuff, I learned from a guy that was 35 years old, died in a plane wreck just a few months later after I was listening to him on AM mm -hmm. Talk Radio. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember that was kind of the moment I said, you know, I feel like I should be living a bigger purpose than just being retired, fat and happy, so to speak, right? And uh, yeah. I think that's the big thing is I, I want to, I want to leave this planet where people feel better and they're actually living better because they've taken those principles and made them work really in their lives. I love that. 
as we approach retirement of this conversation, I really want to focus in on helping the audience understand how you define what it means to retire. You've done it twice, yet you're still working, you're still creating impact, you're still doing this. So what does retirement mean to you and how accessible do you believe it is to what I'm going to call the middle class average person? Yeah. Yeah. For me, like it's really about being work optional, right? is that you get to work because you want to, not because you have to. I mean, so many times you talk to dentists or chiropractors or, you know, doctors or even IT professionals, people like that, right? And, and other business owners, they're saying, you know what? I actually like my work, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to do it on my own terms, you know, yeah. where I can show up to work or I could not, you know, like I have that choice, but I keep showing up because I love it. And, and that's what's happened with me. Like I do it because I feel like I've been blessed by God to have, a, you know, these resources, to have a greater ability to help people so rather than just living quietly in my life and just doing my thing and just saying, cool, I can take care of my family. I can be unemployed, you know, great. I'd rather just take those, some of those resources and use that to help make a bigger megaphone. Right. So, so Beautiful. that's what I really, that's what I really mean. And is it possible for somebody middle class? Well, of course, like if I went over a million dollars broke and I didn't file for bankruptcy, I still had to pay that money back. And then still by the end of 2016 was able to do the same thing and be able to get to the point where I was work optional. Of course you can do it. Yeah. Um, is it easy? It could be easy. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, we have, I had a client that, you know, he retired from the, the military and he had a million bucks and his, his financial advisor said, well, if you have a million dollars, that means you can live on 3% or 30,000 a year. He said, I'm a millionaire. I can live on 30,000 a year. That sounds ridiculous. Yeah. You know, there's gotta be a better way. Cause I can't live on 30,000 a year, especially in California. Well, when he came to us, like we started getting other deals and next thing you know, he's making 130,000 a year without touching his money, you know, yeah. like that makes a massive impact, a massive Huge. difference in people's lives. And so, and again, he was very middle-class, you know, like he's, he just was a good saver. And, you know, even people like, I remember there's a woman that she was single lady, 55 years old down in Arizona. She was a health coach. She's like, yeah, I just want to create a little bit of, you know, extra safety. And I said, well, what do you need per month just to pay at least your basic bills? 2000 a month. Well, I said, well, notice in, you got these mutual funds in the stupid stock market that are 250,000. If you made 10%, you'll make 25,000 a year or 2000 yep. or just over 2000 a month. I said, you could actually retire this year. She had a 10 year retirement goal. I was like, you can do it now. You just have to deploy it in, into the things outside of the stock market. Yeah. So it's actually easier than people think. And that's the thing that lights me up is that when they see the light bulb moment of like, holy crap, like, this could actually happen. This could actually be true. This could actually work. And I can actually not have to gamble my life away in the stock market. I could actually be in things that have real value. They're backed up by real assets and they pay me good income. I don't have to take high risk, create high return, which is a total lie, by the way, because when does the chance of losing become a higher chance of winning? It never works out, right? So yeah. that's the thing that uh, that makes me excited. And, and yeah, so anybody, even middle class, uh, they can do it. In fact, a lot of people we talk to are middle class to upper middle class. Well, thank you for giving those examples just to kind of ground and root what's accessible to so many. And really, to be work optional, it's about escaping the trading time for money game and allowing your money yeah. to buy you time. And that's something and the only asset we can't create more of. It's beautiful. Please let us know where we can find you, how we can follow you. And I'd love it if you could give us a closing thought. Yeah, you can find me at moneyripples.com. Um, I said money ripples, not nipples. I'm not that good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so moneyripples.com. Uh, you can also find our podcast on YouTube, iTunes, wherever you consume podcasts. The Money Ripples podcast is everywhere. Uh, closing Beautiful. thoughts. I would just say this. Um, you know, keep keep learning, right? Like keep, keep doing this stuff. But more importantly, just learning is apply it do it right. Don't just, I say this on my podcast all the time is don't be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word as well. Like the best way I've learned these concepts, like what you're learning on the show today mm -hmm. is take it into your, really into your laboratory of life, right? Take it into your laboratory life, apply the concept. Even if you have to stop on one concept and just try to master it, that'll be way better than trying to figure out, like learn the entire universe and then never applying it. Right. I think Bruce Lee said it best. I think he said, I fear the man, who's practiced the kick 10,000 times than the man that learned 10,000 kicks and did it once. Yep. Right. That's the truth. And actually it wasn't Bruce Lee. It was a Shaolin master, whoever it was. But um, the, the point is still the same, right? Is that, you know, you want to take this stuff and just practice it and practice it in your life over and over. 
that's where real mastery comes from. And that's where real wisdom comes from when you yep. learn these things. Yep. Chris, I really appreciate you being with us today. I'm grateful for who you are and how you're moving through the world, my friend. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And for those of you that watched Chris flip open his lid and jump in, we learned the early childhood dynamics that led to him feeling unworthy, disconnected, alone, overlooked. He shifted his life through a profound moment by studying one of the world leaders who helped others find their voice and he stepped into his own. But just like all of us, we aspire to become someone else. And sometimes we face tragedy, we face loss, we face unexpected shifts and challenges that forces us to go inside and truly surrender. What he's teaching here is to not just learn, but to master. And once you master and you can teach, then all of a sudden you've set yourself free on that particular concept and you can bring others along with you. But to benefit from the ripple effect of life, it's going to require you to be honest with you, stand in and accept your truth, and ultimately flip your lid and scan your cam. What you can probably tell by now is that I love telling these stories, but what I love even more is the impact that's coming from them. You see, we're on a mission to impact over a billion lives as quickly as possible, but to do that, we need you. See, we believe that moved people move people. And so all I'm asking is if you've resonated, connected with any of the messaging, please consider like, commenting, sharing, leave a rating and review. Thank you so much for tuning into Flipping the Lid. And if you want more information on the show, how to become a guest, how to recommend a guest, or any of the other details, head over to flippingthelid.com.